welcome back everyone it's me Matt I really appreciate you stopping by on today's video we're talking a little bit about tanks in the media and if you haven't seen the show known as Valley of Tears which of course is the battle site from the Yom Kippur War in the uh, Northern Golan Heights I would strongly encourage you to watch it it's a very good HBO um, show uh, series and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Now, I want to be very clear here. Uh, this video in no way pertains to any political, religious, or whatever else, uh, you know, motive or reference. This is purely talking about the combat footage of the actual movie itself. Not getting involved with, you know, who sides what and what happened where and, you know, all that sort of stuff. You know my channel. I don't go down that route of politics and religion, things like that. We're purely focusing on the, the uh, intricacies of the scene within the Valley of the Tears that involves two tanks uh, being engaged. And uh, I've had a lot of questions and comments about this particular scene. I thought it'd be nice to review with you guys what happens and my takes on it. Because when we look at, you know, watching shows and movies and we see all these different adaptations of how tank crews would behave, uh, there's a lot of opinionation on what a tank crew should and should not do. And it's really weird because most people who have combat experience know that it's not as simple as just, oh, I would do this and I would do that. Um, we can all be backseat tankers, right? Or, you know, what we think as subject matter experts being the right and wrong way of doing things. And, of course, this particular uh, show does have fictitious references to it. But the overall stance of uh, the tank crews uh, is pretty accurate in this movie. Honestly, I, I would say, you know, the way in which the tanks portray themselves, the crew members working one another, it's pretty accurate. It's pretty cool. Uh, I'm certainly not a subject matter expert of uh, Israeli tank doctrine or tactics uh, for that matter and I'm not going to say that I am but what I will say is that this scene is really interesting because it's a good discussion point. I love sort of referencing and reviewing things like this because it makes you think. It makes you think what would I have done? What what would be a logical situation? Now of course this is a TV show and being the TV show it has copyright etc etc so I have to pause and, and kind of play and pause this to a point where it's just still screen because if I actually play the video, I'm going to get a copyright strike and clear. It's not what I want to do. But I would encourage you to watch this show. It is so good. And before we get into it, though, very quickly, you know, what is this show about? Well, if you haven't done much of your history, uh, now's the time. So the Valley of Tears show is based on the Yom Kippur War. Uh, it was a war that broke out towards the end of the holiday fasts in October 6th, 1973 at around 2 p.m. Uh, Israeli intelligence really had failed to anticipate the assault. The forces were very depleted um, because of the holiday as well at the time. Uh, some of the soldiers fasted, of course, uh, and the Three Miles, or the Valley of Tears in the northern part of Golan, is relatively flat and preferred landscape for the armored attack from Syrian forces. And being so, the Syrians planned to make it one of their main penetration routes. Uh, the assault was accompanied by very heavy artillery, but despite the surprise, um, the Israeli ground forces really managed to hold out in the first few hours very well uh, with their main battle tanks. Uh, even at night, despite the lack of night vision devices, Israeli forces did really well to progress uh, the Syrian forces. And on the second day, the Syrians condensed armored forces and intensified the attack, and Israeli reserve forces that arrived uh, that were sent to the southern sector of the Golan Heights, uh, where the situation was even worse, really had a real tough time. Um, the Israelis depleted their forces at the northern frontier and kept fighting to prevent the Syrian army from advancing. And then during the second night, the Syrians deployed anti-tank missiles, and it just got really really tough at that point they hit some of the israeli uh, tanks but didn't really bring them to, to surrender or to retreat and that's why this scene is what i want to focus on today because this is a scene basically where two tanks are parked up uh, they're having some intercom chatter between uh, the crew commander here and the other crew commander they're obviously very good friends the crews are very tight they've been working with each other for some time um, and they're just sort of overwatching just having some back and forth chatter you know observing for targets and uh, what happens next is, you know, they're having some back and forth chatter, uh, just, you know, totally relaxed at ease. Commanders are popping out the cupolas and have a look around. They're sort of having a back and forth. And unfortunately, uh, and, and guys, there's spoilers in this. So if you haven't seen the show, you don't want to watch um, this and, and get spoilers, then clearly turn off right now before we go any further. Uh, but it's pretty clear to see what's probably going to be happening in these situations, considering the war's actual history. So they're having the back and forth, you know, just giggling away. And uh, the other crew commander sort of popped out of his turret too. They're still having the back and forth. And all of a sudden, uh, the crew commander actually gets shot. And you can see the incoming fire there. Uh, and, and this guy is absolutely devastated. So this is the commander of the other uh, shot, Cal, which is basically the uh, the British 
military tank, right? It is the Centurion tank that has been turned into the Israeli version. So it's had some modifications, some changes for the Israeli forces. Uh, and, you know, he's just been his, his crew commander of the other vehicle, his best friend, has just been shot through the head um, by soldiers nearby, right? They have uh, Syrian uh, you know, troops around hiding up and engage the commander of one of the vehicles. Now, this is already a very intensive situation. The crew inside of this tank are probably freaking out. Uh, and you'll see in the show, they, they panic pretty quick. And your commander is is the heart of the tank, right? The, and as a crew commander myself, when I was working with track fighting vehicles, the responsibility falls upon you, right? You have a lot of things to coordinate, whether it be the driver, other vehicles, uh, being engaged. In my particular stance, I was the gunner and the commander because in my 512, the coaxial machine gun or the uh, chain gun was our primary source of defense. We certainly weren't an engagement vehicle. We were there as a repair vehicle and we defended ourselves with the uh, 7.62mm machine gun. So you have a lot of things to think about. And as a tank commander, a main battle tank commander, you're a primary target, right? And if you're popping out of the Kapala, you are a primary engagement. And of course, these troops, the Syrian troops that engaged the commander took him out. So... This is an absolute nightmare for a crew. Losing your commander is, is pretty stressful. Uh, you know, the gunner is only as effective as what he can see, and he can only see through, technically, his own capability through his sights. The loader is pretty much hatched down, putting rounds into the gun or preparing the uh, machine gun for secondary ammunition if necessary. And the driver is the driver, right? So the eyes and the ears primarily of the tank is the commander, and this crew has just lost their commander. And as you can see, you know, they start getting freaked out. You know, a gunshot wound to the head. If you don't like blood, then unfortunate. Now, this is the thing that I want to focus on next. We're going to go back to the other tank now. So the other tank, the, the loader is, is out as well. Uh, he's starting to engage with his uh, his 30 caliber there. Uh, and, and sort of spraying in the general direction of the troops that just engaged his fellow tank. By the way, I love that the uh, Uzi was used um, during this, this conflict. Like, the fact... When you see the Uzi being used in the, in the show, and of course one of the primary weapon systems of the Israeli forces, it's just like mind-boggling that the Uzi was, you know, you think of the Uzi, it's like a, I guess sort of a, uh, you know, gangster-style weapon, but you see the Uzi in the show, it's, it just it brings a smile to my face, you're like, wow, that was actually a primary weapon system. Anyway, so the, the loader's engaging, right, and here's the key part now, and this is the part that people keep asking me about. The commander of the other vehicle freaks out. And why wouldn't you, right? It's, it's his best friend, you know, fellow commanders have a close bond, uh, whether it be, you know, squadron commander or, you know, troop commander that, you know, they aspire to or look up to or just best friends, right? And this commander of this tank just really goes into the uh, into the wild and loses, loses it a little bit, okay? Now, again, this is one of those situations where fight or flight, right? He chose, in this particular instance, somewhat of both, right? He wanted to fight, he wanted to get into the battle, but his flight response was, my best friend's just had his head shot off, and I'm going to go try and help him or support him in the other tank. Now, the question I always get asked is, Matt, is this, this seems like a really bad idea. Would this be something you think would be applicable in real life? Would this be something that would happen? Would you leave your crew behind, disembark, and go find and support the other crew? And this is why I love having these discussions, because it's totally subjective, right? You could say, yes, it makes complete sense. You know, the other crew's lost their commander. My crew's probably, you know, he may have believed his crew is better in skill and competency and being on their own and looking after themselves. But in my eyes, when I look at this scene, I, I look at it from two sides, right? The I commend this commander in this fictional hypothetical sense that he's being, A, brave enough to expose himself I mean, he's literally, his whole body's exposed to being engaged right now um, to go and support his other crew member. But in this instance, his logic part of his brain isn't thinking as much. At this point, both tanks are completely, I wouldn't say completely useless, but they've lost like 25% of their combat capability, right? The gunner can still traverse, he can still scan for targets, but the eyes and the ears, the coordination, the nervous system of the tank is gone from both vehicles. Now we have a crew commander that's been killed and a crew commander that is disembarked he hasn't even got, you know, in those days, they didn't have communications that you could dis disembark and have sort of a wireless setting. He has no communication with his crew other than screaming up to his loader who's punching 30 caliber rounds everywhere into the bushes, not truly knowing where these troops are. Now both tanks are basically just pillboxes with small slits to look through and engaging targets. These are old tanks, guys. Centurions didn't have commanders in pent thermal viewers scanning around. They're on their own. So, you know, I, I commend his bravery and the fact that he wants to go help Buddy and, you know, go and find out what's going on. 
But his crew is like, um, okay, what are we doing now? I'm. Are you going to designate targets? Where are they shooting from? Because, you know, as a gunner, you don't have the field of view or the vision that you would expect that the command would have, right? And these are older tanks, right? So you're looking through standardized sights. So, you know, even the driver's kind of freaking out, like, what is happening? You know, he's hatched down again, very small, limited amount of view in this area. He's looking through. And if I was in this crew, I'd be kind of freaking out. Because you don't know, especially when, you know, someone's gone to the point of, like, literally losing their mind. You know, they've literally uh, totally freaked out. Are they abandoning us because they're running away? Now, I'm sure the crew in this situation would know, yeah, he's not leaving us behind. Something serious is happening. Uh, but he, this crew commander darts for the other tank. And as he darts for the other tank, right, he just about gets there, spins around... And unfortunately, the other crew, okay, the other tank, get engaged by what's probably an RPG. Right? It's not a main, main gun round. Uh, interestingly, you'll notice that the, uh, the uh, empty case or loading hatch is, is open on this vehicle, which is unusual. Uh, because in a combat scenario like this, uh, you want to keep as much, much protection as you can on the turret and the hull. Uh, you would normally have this closed because this would only be open in the instance of emptying brass out of the turret or reloading brass inside of it or rounds inside of it. And, you know, by this point, most of the brass should have already been ejected from the turret. And if you're in an overwatch position, this should be closed. Your ammunition should be all stowed or pre-prepped and ready to go. So just an interesting dynamic there. But the tank gets, you know, engaged by some sort of anti-tank weapon. Uh, it completely destroys it, right? I mean, it really does just blast it to pieces. Um, and the crew commander is literally watching his other crew burn alive, right? Getting, getting killed. So now, not only is there a tank with no commander that's been killed, there is only one tank that's actually effective and operational now. So this situation has spiraled out of control drastically. Now, you can argue that, well, if he'd have stayed in the tank, he would have died anyway. But this is what I mean, right? It's that fight or flight response. If you're a commander of the vehicle, no matter what happens in the other vehicle, your responsibility is to look after your crew. And your other crew's responsibility is to look after their crew. They're trained to see what happens when a commander is being killed or in, you know, injured. They know what to do, right? Or maybe they don't in the, you know, battle stresses. But in this scenario, right, it's gone completely wrong. <laughs> um, and and I, I, I'm on the wall about it. You know, as I said, I commend his his bravery and his, his honor and looking after and trying to get his best friend, which, you know, your brain doesn't think logically sometimes. But in this essence, it's made the worst decision ever, right? He could have seen or, or objectively seen targets in the distance, silhouettes, movement, uh, someone mounting up and kneeling with an RPG. He had his 30 caliber on the cupola there. He could have engaged. His, his loader could have been traced onto targets with using his binos. Uh, could have brought his gunner on, uh, spraying coax down into the wood lines, whatever. He would have had full control of the tank. The tank would have been an asset. It wouldn't have been uh, a pillbox that it is right now, right? And pillboxes have limited amount of support. They're just basically a turret or a slit in the wall that can look around, and that's about it. And the whole crew's dead now, right? So, <laughs> and, and not only dead, he's watching his troops inside of it trying to escape and burning alive. And that is, I mean, that's soul-destroying, right? I mean, you can see here... Uh, not only has he lost his buddy in his, his, in his other vehicle, he's lost his entire crew and watching them burn alive. I mean, I, I can't imagine it's that in that situation if you're even going to be capable of, of controlling yourself in that, that situation. I mean, that's some serious stuff, right? I mean, you, this face really does depict what I'm sure would have been a re reaction in this situation. I mean, that's just soul-destroying. Anyway, so um, the tank completely cooks off, right? The crew pretty much done for uh and he decides you know what uh i'm not giving up on the fight yet commend him for this too uh he climbs into the other vehicle now and decides to pretty much tell his crew okay we're, we're going charging we're gonna go head on uh we're gonna go and find this uh this detachment that's engaging us with a small uh, assault squad here go take him out now again in this instance it rages all out right he is completely mortified uh his his fight or flight is now turned into full fight uh he's lost just about everything right his best friend his other crew uh, and now he's just going into it no matter what right and his logic as a commander probably is once again gone out of the window right he's saying this is for shuki or however you say that name um and in this instance believe it or not in the, in the show and it is all sort of uh 
it's fictional for the actual specifics. But, you know, he goes all in, guns blazing. Uh, here's the detachment, right, that's engaging the small uh, small RPG team. And they go all out, right? I mean, they run them over, they, they spray and pray, and the gunner, and everyone's just going, you know, crazy. Uh, and they kill them, right? They kill the killer crew. Uh, and uh, even throws a grenade, which is interesting. He pops a grenade over there, and, you know, all out chaos, right? And, again, you know, as a commander... It must be terrifying in that kind of situation to know that there's an RPG team around the corner that just took out one tank and could in, in any instance take out another. And some people may have said, well, you know, why didn't you put your smoke discharges and pull out of there? You put a full risk to another crew there too. Look, it, it, again, this is just a fictional situation. But if you look at it in a real term perspective, if you were a crew commander and this thing had happened, right, I would probably have done the exact same thing. I would have been so furious that I would just ask my crew, okay, we're going to take these guys out one way or another. Whether it's me climbing over the front decks with a grenade and a 30 cal dismounted and belt hanging from a hip, or it's us going as a crew and using the turret and using the, you know, the coax and everything else. And I think in this situation, he used the right choice, right? He had to find that RPG team. There was no way around this, right? I think in the essence of things, to put your smoke discharge and pull out, yes, could have been a viable option, but I don't think... He would be fully aware of if there was more in-depth positions around him that were just going to get him anyway. So he said, you know what? Let's do this. I'm, I'm to take on this squad. It's either them or me. Uh, and he pushed and it, it, it worked for them, right? And even in this instance, the, the driver actually, again, spoilers, runs them over and, you know, they go all out crazy. I mean, they really do uh, just annihilate this RPG team. And the commander, you know, finishes up and, and everyone's dead and, you know, he kind of falls into a sobbing you know, craziness, because he's completely lost at this point. Uh, the adrenaline is probably completely pumping through his, you know, his veins. And I, I'd love to hear your opinion on this, folks. You know, from, from the very beginning, uh, there's definitely some red flags. I mean, you know, if you're in an Overwatch position, back and forth chit-chat is, is all good. But considering you know that you're in an environment where you, you know, your country's being attacked, uh, you've lost other crews, you know, there's literally an entire armored force coming for you. I can tell you this much, I'm not going to be chit-chatting with Buddy. I'm going to be scanning my arcs as much as possible. Now, again, the realities of war is it's not quite as simple as that. You know, when you start, you know, engaging targets and, you know, then you come into the reprieve of not engaging targets anymore, you need that natural break as a human to just hang out with Buddy and talk. But, you know, in this fictitious situation, probably wouldn't have even happened if they'd be scanning their arcs correctly, not playing around, not goofing around uh, with the headsets, talking to one another. Uh, monitoring over the over the sites that 30 and engaging but again backseat tanker right you can talk about all day long but the real thing that hit me was you know yes your friend has been killed yes it must be god awful uh but you have to trust the crew to to do what they can for that for that soldier right and and use your 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 fight or flight needs to be controlled right panic doesn't solve anything that's why drills are important right it's terrifying I mean, i've lost friends right uh in situations where you know you want to go help you want to go do something but at the end of the day this situation can just become a lot worse from you reacting the wrong way right and, and losing your crew and and now you're in a situation where you've been forced hand to not only watch your crew burn alive and your best friend die but you know, then send another crew potentially to their death with not logical thinking and driving in head first, which, you know, in this instance worked. So I would love to hear your opinion on this, folks. Again, the show is called The Valley of Tears. It is really good. Lots of uh, good tank on tank engagements. Um, honestly, the grand scheme of things, the realistic side of the tanking is, is pretty cool. I think the tactics as well, you know, pulling into the hold down positions, reversing and engaging again. Uh, even the adjustment on shots when you, you watch the show, it's pretty cool. Um, so take a look again I don't want to emphasize any political or religious uh, bias or, or discussion here this is purely based upon the fictitious situation in this TV show uh, and uh, I hope you enjoyed today's video let me know what you think I'd love to hear your opinion in the comment section below also I encourage you to click the like button or the thumb button uh, so that my channel and my video get some a little bit more uh, attraction to this video because of course it's military content especially anything to do with a conflict like this it gets a little bit tricky so I appreciate if you could leave me a like if you did enjoy the video also you can click the little bell by the subscribe button so you can be notified of content in the future and if you do want to support my channel you can check out my patreon in the description box below or my paypal and my social media links are there too hope you have a wonderful day everyone all the best
Bye-bye.